Welcome to the Shifting Roles and Changing Perceptions panel. Most actors think they can write. Most writers think they can direct. Most directors think they can write. And most extremely good looking people think they can act. <laughs> what most people discover is that those things aren't as easy as when you're talking about them on the couch at Starbucks. And what makes someone great at one thing doesn't necessarily translate into the others. The skill sets are different, the, trend, the, the discipline is different, the way you communicate with others is different. And yet, there are those among us who are born with a special ability, which, by the way, is how every pitch of the CW started. <laughs> These are, these are people born with an innate storytelling gene that transcends job titles. People who can arc out the emotional uh, journey of one character on screen and can create a world for that character and multiple others to struggle through for 22 episodes and envision the best way to capture and present it to an audience. My name is Andrew Miller, I'm a writer. I created a show for the CW called The Secret Circle. <laughs> I've written uh, numerous movies and TV pilots, but before that, I, before writing, I spent 15 years as an actor. My transition was incredibly easy because I was a terrible actor. <laughs> and no one saw me act, so I wasn't pigeonholed, which is a problem a lot of people face as they're shifting positions. The people we're gonna meet today make this transition look like a natural evolution. They're the examples that the coffee shop dreamers aspire to. We're gonna talk to them today about how they made the transition and the challenges that arise from moving from one discipline to the other, the stigma that's sometimes associated with artists stepping outside, what they're known for, and which job is the easiest. Acting, obviously, but we'll get it. <laughs> um, let's start with, uh, uh, in no particular order, but according to my notes, Tom Verica, as an actor, please. Stop, stop, stop. As an actor, Tom, and please correct me if my crack staff of me is wrong, uh, <laughs> has appeared as an actor in everything from Quantum Leap to Seinfeld, the 4400 to Princess Protection Program, Will and Grace. Thanks for that one, hold on. <laughs> when you see that on IMDb, it's impossible to resist. Uh, really, by the way, it's really good. I've seen it many times. I have an eight-year-old daughter. I was gonna say, if you have a daughter, it's around eight years old. Yeah. And of course, uh, American Dreams. I think applause is. <laughs> Let's not get quiet now for American Dreams. Uh, Tom has directed episodes of American Dreams, Boston Legal, Ugly Betty, No Ordinary Family, Grey's Anatomy, a lot of ABC so far, Private Practice, and is currently the directing co EP on Scandal. <laughs> Scott Ackerman started in musical theater, moved into writing and performing comedy, worked on Mr. Show, Shark Tale, Puss in Boots, and my personal favorite, the aggressively underrated Run, Ronnie, Run. He transitioned from really? radio shows to TV, podcasts to TV, Zach Galifianakis movies to Zach Galifianakis internet interview shows. He created the Comedy Death Ray Stage Show, which became the Comedy Death Ray Radio Show, which became the Comedy Death Ray Podcast, which became the Comedy Bang Bang podcast, which has become the incredibly funny, star-studded IFC television series, Comedy Bang Bang. Hi. Check, 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 check. Is this check. <laughs> Nothing? All right. Hey, Hi, everyone. Hi. Oh, the sound right there. I'm saying check to nothing. Everything <laughs> check uh, that's an idea. This is only and badly. <laughs> Let's change some perceptions about who can raise these mic levels. Check, 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 check. Check. Oh, there we go. Austin, how we doing out there? Let's shift perceptions. <laughs> to my immediate right, Dan Pukintinsky. Dan is an actor, writer, producer, and director. He's appeared in a long list of half-hour comedies and hour dramas like Sybil, Friends, Will and Grace, Party of Five, NYPD Blue, In Plain Sight, and currently Scandal. People seem less excited to clap for Scandal the second time around. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I gave it up for that already. Um, 
He also produces the Emmy-nominated NBC reality series, Who Do You Think You Are? And has written a book about being a gay father called, Does This Baby Make Me Look Fat? <laughs> no, does it? Because it's called, Does This Baby Make Me Look Straight? Which it also doesn't. <laughs> My book is, is uh, for straight snack eaters called Does This Extra 20 Pounds Make Me Look Fat? <laughs> Don also wrote and starred in the feature film All Over the Guy, wrote and acted on Grey's Anatomy, wrote and acted in The Comeback, and created, writes, produces, and acts in the Emmy Award winning Web Therapy. Woohoo! I feel like of all the things you do, your true talent is making me feel lazy. <laughs> Brad Bell is a writer and actor who created the breakout YouTube character Cheeks and turned him into the star of the award-winning comedy series Husbands. Soon to, be... Soon to be featured on the CW Seed that he writes with writing goddess Jane Espenson and stars in with, among other people, writing god Joss Whedon. Thank you. Uh, Tom, let's start with you. Uh, uh, this is less of a question than a comment. Um, I can make it a question. Uh, Princess Protection Program. <laughs> is it true that I think your character on American Dreams, Jack Pryor, is one of the two best father figures of our generation, the other being Coach Taylor? Uh, is it true? Um, wow, well, that's a pretty loaded question. I, I wouldn't have put it in that category. As far as the character playing it, I um, thoroughly enjoyed and I think to some extent drew on some experiences of my father growing up in Philadelphia. Um, not quite as strict as, as that character was, uh, but it was a very rich character and one that I don't normally get to play that type of, uh, that type of role. Uh, I think we were doing the math with Will Estes, who played my son, who I think we're 12 years apart, 13 <laughs> years apart, so I think we were cast, we were Well, like the 60s, about. people were. Exactly, yeah, they, had him, they had him younger then. Uh, I, I don't, it, it's, it's, uh, it's certainly an honor to be mentioned that, but yeah, it was a terrific character. It was a character that I uh, have enjoyed probably more than most characters. And as far as American Dreams go, my impression is that you had directed, either during that experience or before, a couple of short films, and was American Dreams, was, your, was that your professional directorial debut? That kind of, that would be considered the professional directing debut. I think uh, I had started directing probably, I, I, I had an interest in it in the mid-90s. I started then, I, I started following and observing and shadowing whatever title. There's many titles of what you do when you, you basically just follow behind somebody and say, give me a shot. Um, and. 2000, I started to um, make a couple shorts. When I got the series, uh, I kind of let them know right away that my, I had you know, in, interest in directing and p p potentially directing an episode, to which they laughed. You know, another actor wants to direct. <coughs> um, and it wasn't until a buddy of mine had written a, uh, a pilot that he asked me to direct that we tried to sell, we did not. Um, and I directed it, we, we shot it, and screened it for the cast and crew at American Dreams, and the producers were there, and they saw it, and they actually went, oh, shit, okay, you, can, you know what you're doing. <laughs> so they turned around and offered me an episode, and then after that, that went well, they offered me another episode. And I think I've always had that uh, brain as an actor, uh, I, I've always had an eye towards that in that direction. And what was the experience like with your fellow actors? Did anyone else want to direct? I don't know if people completely appreciate, especially on an ensemble show like that, you know, there could be a number of people with those sort of aspirations, and then is it awkward? Is directing your fellow castmates that you've been... Yeah, it, it, uh, it was second season when I got my crack. Um, it was, nobody else had aspirations, mainly because everyone was under 16, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure that they worried about, you know, opening that door that, you know, suddenly the nine-year-old was gonna want to direct recently. <laughs> Um, no, but I, I, no one else uh, had, and, and no one else made any roads toward that. I think Gail O'Grady was the other adult in our cast, uh, and she'd be a horrific director, and I love her, and I say that reminds me. <laughs> but uh, it was great. I mean, it was, um, it was just intimidating, I think, the experience at first, having an entire crew just kind of looking at you, waiting to see what we're going to do next and what you have plans for that scene. 
Um, but that being said, it was uh, tremendously nurturing to have a, a crew that I knew and personalities that I knew to make that experience a, a little more easier than, say, when I ventured out uh, after that into my first gig outside of that, which was another hurdle to overcome, uh, which was Boston Legal and dealing with a completely new crew and new personalities. <laughs> Uh, so, and that, that was, uh, so there was a lot of, yeah, I was lucky, I think, to have that experience be my first, uh, and knowing full well that I'll be back, play my character next episode, and, you know, they can only give me so much shit. <laughs> <laughs> and you're the father. Um, Scott, the, going from podcast to television show, was the essence of the podcast, how, what is the essence of the podcast, comedically speaking, and then... How did you have to tailor that or change it to move to in front of the camera? Uh, I mean, the reason I did the podcast was because I had gotten into a kind of rut in my career where, because I started out as a comedian and I started out as a performer, and then my first professional job was as a writer, technically, but writer-performer uh, on Mr. Show, but I just got way more into the writing from that and I got way more jobs. And it just was so much easier to work as an actor, or sorry, as a writer than as an actor. I just couldn't get any work as an actor, so I just kind of was a writer for 10 years. And then I really missed it, so I started doing the podcast um, just for fun. And um, because I missed performing, I missed kind of like dicking around with other comedians. And so I did that just for fun. And um, a couple years into it, I got offered a TV show to, to do a TV show version of it which was a, a weird surprise because I'd basically just given up acting. Um, so to me, it was um, interesting to try to rejigger my mind back into, oh, okay, I'm gonna be in front of the camera now and I'm not gonna be uh, the person calling all the shots from behind it. So, uh, you know, when I adapted it into a TV version, I just tried to make it um, the most visual uh, television version of it I could. The podcast, the essence of it is a fake interview show where I interview celebrities and comedians as fake celebrities. So I just took the essence of that and did it as a TV show and just tried to kind of, you know, re get my mind back into that place of like performing and trying to be funny on camera. <laughs> and it was, it was definitely challenging the first year just doing the pilot. It was like, oh shit, I'm actually doing this now. I'm like, <laughs> Um, but but it, it definitely was uh, an interesting challenge for me. And I, I, this is probably the, the wrong panel. I don't know if this counts as shifting sure. directions, but it, it just feels like the jokes, the TV jokes are just different. So, like you're cutting yeah. to a comedian tending bar. You know you know what I mean? Like it, it conceptually, it feels like a big shift to me. Uh, from the podcast, you mean? Yeah. yeah well, uh, uh, the podcast is like an hour and a half long, so it's shorter. <laughs> Definitely. Um, as far as I know, it's 22 minutes an episode. Um, so we just don't have enough time to kind of play around the, the way that we do on the podcast. On the podcast, if any of you guys have heard it, is basically I'll have someone on the show, like Judd Apatow, for instance, and then I'll have one or two or three comedians playing uh, weirdos <laughs> or strange people and then I interview people like The Tonight Show, basically, where we all kind of talk to each other and we all find out about these really strange people's lives. Um, since we only have 22 minutes on the show, uh, and I didn't want it to be a really boring 22 minutes of just one conversation between three people, uh, I turned it into, into more of a sketch show. And, and IFC, which is the network it's on, was really supportive of me. And they said, well, you've always wanted to do a sketch show. You grew up wanting to be a performer. Just make this the sketch show you always wanted to do. And so I did the sketch show I've always wanted to do. <laughs> but, but the interesting thing about it being a fake talk show is it gives it a, a weird center and a, a hub almost where it doesn't feel like a sketch, a normal sketch show where anything can happen. It feels like it always comes back to this strange talk show that's going on. Yeah, as though The Tonight Show became a sketch, I mean, yeah. the guests become sketches. Yeah, exactly. Um, Dan? Yeah. Uh, you, <laughs> see if I'm right about this, but it, it seems to me that you have a story credit on an episode of Sybil. I do. That you also <laughs> performed on as an actor, playing two different characters. 
Right. I didn't perform in the episode that I have a story credit on. But, but you were an actor on Sybil a couple I, times? I acted a few times on Sybil. And then how, I don't know, we, I'm sure we have some actors out here, you can't swing a dead cat, no. Um, <laughs> but how does that work? Like how, how, you're an actor doing this, a guest star on a sitcom, and yeah. you're like, I've got an idea for an episode. No, that, that, was was about relation, that was purely about a relationship. I mean, that very specific circumstance was like they say, you know, it's about who you know. and. I, I, I had started always as an actor. I've always been an actor first, and when I was in New York and trying to act and doing theater, and I wrote a sketch show that I was performing, and the director of that sketch show that we were performing in like the nightclubs and the clubs in New York was a woman named Linda Wallum, who then became a, a showrunner in, in, in LA and became one of the executive producers and co-executive producers of Sybil. So when we were all out in LA at the same time, she drew on the talent pool that she rem she knew from New York, not just to throw a story to as well. She'd always like ask if I had any ideas, and but she threw me a couple of roles on Civil, which was a great break for me at that time because I was as an actor and writer. As an actor, and because I was a writer, you know, my writing for me was always a means to perform because I wasn't just being discovered in coffee shops the way I thought I would be. <laughs> so um, I had to sort of make, I was desperate to make uh, opportunities for myself. So I wrote this sketch show and I performed it and then I, I brought the, the, that show to Los Angeles and I performed it and I started to get attention as a writer based on the work that I had written. And as frustrating as that was for me in a way, because I really just wanted to you know, be on 90210 and call it a day. Um, I continued to write as a means of performing. And so uh, that was a great opportunity for me to just get some credits, um, you, you know, um, at that time. But I had been writing all along, and then eventually I, I wrote a movie. With, with all due respect, it feels bullshitty to me, only in that you're like my grandparents in, like, who grew up in the Depression yeah. and now can't stop saving money or something. You know what I mean? Like, right. If you only ever wanted to be an actor, you could be, you're like a superstar actor on Scandal. You could quit all the other stuff. So N No, I'm not. <laughs> Scandal is an insanely popular, I mean, yes. it, it feels like if you just wanted to be an actor, you've got a rich enough life that you could be like, oh, I go two days a week, I argue, I... You, know, you, are, you are sadly deceived <laughs> by, by, yes, but I, I, it's a, it is a misconception. It is a misconception. This is like the biggest thing I've learned in the, in the years that I've been a writer and an actor and the things that I do. Um, yes, I'm really fortunate to play an unbelievably great role on Aha! Scandal. No. <laughs> I'm not a regular on Scandal. I am, a, I am invited to perform on episodes of that show, and I am happy to do it every time I'm asked. But, you know, I, I am also a writer, and I also have two kids to feed, and so I have to find in all the things that I do, I look to make, I, like your grandparents, uh, who live in depression, I gotta make a living! <laughs> so I do as many things as I have to do. I would be happy to be on Scandal <laughs> as a full-time job. As you prorate your pay with the ratings, right? But it's perfect. <laughs> exactly, depending on how many you know, hits on Twitter I get. No, I'm, I'm thrilled to be on Scandal. It is a great opportunity for me, and I currently write on Grey's Anatomy. I, I, you know, I found a great like a mentor in Shonda Rhimes, and I'm doing a lot with her right we now. Got, we got to get to Brad, but but yeah, but the, 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 I had to correct you there. No, no, I I, I get conceptually what you're saying. I, you wouldn't have written a book if you were just looking to make money. Right, I have not made so, it correct. Correct. That's a whole different story, though. I, yes, I wrote a book because I had a kid, and it was an experience as a gay man and as a gay father that I felt like I wanted to tell. It was not a lucrative thing. It wasn't something that that I was doing for the money. But it was something that yeah, I but it's like. good marketing. It it um, tells the world about you and all your other projects. And I feel like you're trying to tell Brad about your experience now, so that they can have a gay kid on husbands <laughs> and, they and then bring you we're in. Not, we're not having gay kids on husbands. Did I, did I turn my mic down? Or turn um, well, you won't know if your kids are gay whether you're okay. in No, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> but you should be open to whatever they do. You're right. No, they're going to, if they tell me they're I'm straight. Damn you, Brad. I'm not going to. Um, just lastly, though, as far as Grays goes, did you, did you get to that? That you started just for the pure writing of it all, and then, like, did that happen both at the same time, or? 
I was Did you on, get staff? I was on an episode of Grey's Anatomy okay. a couple of years ago. Go. And then uh, as an actor, and Shonda and I auditioned to play several roles on Scandal, and I did not, I wasn't Huck, as you can tell. <laughs> and I was fortunate enough to, to be able to play a different role that, that Shonda had in mind for me when I got offered the part of James. And um, so, uh, I, but I have relationships with other writers, and, and I was asked to consult uh, a, few times, uh, a few days a week on Grays. I feel so like uh, defensive. I don't know why. <laughs> I do a lot of things, but I because, because uh, they're all legitimate. They're all legitimate, and I work really hard. And uh, I feel very lucky to be able to do those things. <laughs> no, I, and we all appreciate that you do. I think. I think it, it's it's it seems to make that no no just to make the, it, it it feels like a difficult. And by the way, I've been I, writing pilots for 20 years. I've written 16 pilots, and I shot a lot of them. So just just to be clear, my career as a writer is what led me to be able to get a right. job on Grey's Anatomy, not so. No, and, 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 and to your point earlier, I, when I was a, a, a fledgling, failing actor, my joke was always that no matter how successful actors get, when they see someone else in a room or a bar or a coffee right. shop, they're like, Jesus, you work all the time, and then that person says. I worked eight days this year. It's just right. you saw me in two movies, so it feels like I'm, you know. Correct. But the reality is, at a, you know, there are 350 something I don't know, <laughs> that I'm sitting around, you know, playing video games. So I, I, I certainly see. But thank you for. <laughs> Hard hitting journalism. <laughs> um, Brad, you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Okay, all right, all right. Um, you're gonna do the gotcha thing. I'm ready for it. Go <laughs> ahead. <laughs> Someone's gonna cry or scream at me. No. You, you are. Describe your life when you're when you decide to when you create cheeks and when you start deciding to upload YouTube videos. Are you just a are you a, a regular guy with a, an idea for no, a funny character? I've or never you... been a regular guy. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Uh, it was a combination of things. It was, I think I saw the, um, the, the business aspect first. I was fascinated by the idea when somebody told me about YouTube when it first was, you know, hey, have you heard about this website? Um, it occurred to me like, well, that's how you get your CAA agents to come see you or the guys over at William Morris. That, you don't have to invite them to your showcase or whatever that old archaic model is. You send them a link. Like, that's okay. And then I started noticing um, this trend, which maybe it's always been this way, and it was just sort of um, made worse when the internet came about, or video, or reality TV. But people that are in the press, people that are getting projects made, are less and less talented, hardworking people, and more and more just people that everyone knows. Like, you know, um, and that's not to say there's not a lot of quality stuff out there, but you know, Snooki getting a spin-off of her show, or like, somebody the other day was like, oh, in fact, it was Snooki who was saying <laughs> <laughs> on the phone with me when we were... Um, you were obsessed with Snooki. I had to, well, I had to Skype for our book club um, because I was out of town. Uh, uh, she was saying, you know, Amanda Bynes needs a reality show, and unfortunately, I thought, God, that, that would get a lot of ratings. Like, in some world, that is brilliant. I, it's not brilliant, it's horrible, but people love a train wreck, and... Um, and that's why I'm such a train wreck. No, uh, I, I, eyeballs are what matters, and that occurred to me. Uh, and when I saw YouTube, I thought, okay, so the more of an audience you have, the more leverage you have. And it really just depends how many people are watching you, and the quality of what you do is kind of up to you. And that's initially why I started. But at that point, ideally, was it to be, it, when you dreamed of a CAA agent, were they an acting agent or a writing agent or both? Um, that was always kind of murky for me. Uh, I grew up writing, but I think I kind of talked myself out of being a writer, um, just because I wasn't um, sitting in the corner and sort of angry at everyone. Wanting <laughs> <laughs> nobody to talk to me. And that, to me, that was the writer. The writer was the, the geek who grew up to say, oh, I'm going to make you beautiful people pay, <laughs> and then you do this. Um, You're describing me right now. Yeah. Uh, and some writers do that, and some writers are not. Everyone is unique and special. Um, but, and, and yeah, I mean, I, I was interested in, in 
directing and in editing, and uh, a professor of mine actually said, I, I made sort of like a, a mock music video for an editing class and didn't have anyone to play the, you know, the artist, so I just filled in. And she said, why aren't you in front of the camera? And I said, I don't know, and I did that growing up, and I just, I'm not interested in being just an actor. No offense to the actors. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> and she said, be in front of the camera, and, and when you're old and you don't have your looks anymore, you can sit behind the camera and write things and, and do all of this um, editing stuff. So it just, one thing led to another, and I started writing my own material because um, I had really strong opinions about stuff, and I figured tapping into uh, current cultural things would uh, be the most effective way to build my audience. And then. Did someone, how did, how did that transition actually happen? Like, you're getting hits and it's fun and you're uploading videos about the CIA having an anti-gay division and then Jane calls you and says- Did you see that video? Yeah, I saw that video. That's cool. <laughs> and then- You did your research. Yeah, I'm not fucking around you. There you go. Um, that shit's buried. That was my first video. You're and definitely not fucking And then Jane calls you, you know, how does that, if you're, like, I'm sure there are people here that upload videos all the time, how do they get to Joss Whedon and Jane Espen? Uh, talent? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's sexual favors, let's be honest. <laughs> um, I, uh, yeah, Jane uh, saw a video that I did about uh, marriage equality. It was a response to uh, Carrie Prashant when she gave her big convoluted answer as to why, you know, uh, she believed in opposite marriage and not same-sex marriage. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, and that was that was one of the many things that happened for me. I, I was brought in uh, by casting directors at Fox, and um, uh, a, a lot of opportunities opened up for me. I was sometimes cast in like you know short films, uh, sight unseen. Other places auditioned me. Other people just reached out and said, I don't have anything for you yet, but um, you know, let's hang out. And that was essentially what Jane did. Was she just said. I, I really like your style of writing. Let's go to lunch. Let's hang out. Um, and there wasn't, it wasn't like, listen, kid, we're going to make you a star. <laughs> um, in, in my memory, of my fantasy memory, that's the way it happened. <laughs> but yeah, we hung out and we were really, we were just friends mostly for, for two years, having lunch and hanging out. And it was, uh, it was when we noticed the consistency of our creative choices. You know, when we would pick something apart or um, love something and have a conversation about like where it worked, where it didn't, that we noticed that we were constantly on the same page. So we decided to take it to the same page. <laughs> um, and we just thought, yeah, Husbands was a, a really good story. It was, um, it was timely and it felt like it should have been done already. And um, yeah, so we wrote it. I wrote the first draft in just a few hours and sent it over to her. That's annoying. <laughs> <laughs> and that's coming from him. <laughs> A couple of minutes. No, a few hours. 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 Minutes. Well, that's yeah. hours. I heard in my version. I heard minutes. Wait, you could do it in hours. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, it, it, you set a standard for yourself then, because there were plenty of times when we have something to write, and like a few days goes by, and I get an email from Jane, and she's like, "So do you have anything?" I'm like, "I'm working on it. Leave me alone. It can't always happen in a night." <laughs> Uh, Tom, your first TV appearance was on the precursor to Dance Party USA. Uh, dancing on air. Was the transition from dancer to actor more or... We're, we're talking about changing Where perceptions. Where the hell is you from? We're talking about changing perceptions. This is... Um, what, uh, what qualities... Or let me ask you this. Now that you're a big shot on Scandal, when... Presumably, you don't have to say who. It could be Dan. When someone, you, you, you're in a meeting and someone says, we're renegotiating someone's contract, they want to direct. Are you the guy who says, like in the meetings I've been in where everyone goes, oh great, we're gonna get an actor directing, now we're screwed. Or do you see something in the actors that you know, regular executives don't see because of your experience? And are you more encouraging of that? Or can you spot it more easily? Uh, I think all those things. I think. Uh, I think I can, Shonda ultimately makes the call uh, with Scandal, all things Scandal. Uh, but I definitely uh, looked at and 
listen to as far as uh, what my experience is. Tony Goldwyn, who was uh, an established director long before uh, Scandal came along, uh, that was a no-brainer. He directed the season, yeah. uh, and I think it was part of his contract. Um, none of the other actors have expressed uh, yet on the show <laughs> is that, that they have an interest in, in directing. I have no interest in directing. <laughs> We're all, yeah. we're all dreading that. <laughs> no. Um. No, but, but, just, but just but to that, and I mean, I feel like it's, this is a tough trick. What, what you are all doing is, is really difficult because of exactly this, which is to say, you go, look, you're a good actor, and, but just stay in your little box, and please don't bug us, because we're, people don't like, I think there's a natural sense that we don't like other people you know, just jumping in and doing what we've spent a long time doing. And that's understandable. I mean, I, uh, you know, 25 years as an actor, when I threw my hat into directing, I think uh, I was faced with the same challenges. I think they thought another actor who wants to direct. Um, but I, I kind of went out and, and took it upon myself and, and uh, my partner and I, my buddy who, who wrote this, we, we pulled all the resources and did everything ourselves and shot it on the weekends. Um, and made it happen. And it, it, that's, uh, I had to create my own calling card, and that's really what happened. It wasn't by gift. And, and I, I can certainly recognize when, if somebody's really serious about it, because uh, it, I, I do get, you know, any, any given week, I'll get a number of calls from fellow actors who I've worked with over the years saying, hey, I'm interested in directing, you know, I know you did it, can you talk? And, you know, depending upon who they are, what my relationship with, uh, with them was, I will sit down and talk with them, but I, pretty much right away I can gauge as to whether I think this person might or, or might not be, and not that it's, it's my position to decide whether they're going to succeed or not, but I, I think there is, uh, I'm able to identify, I think, a little bit more uh, the actors who have the brain, because there are some brilliant actors who would be horrible directors, sure. there's some mediocre actors who would be great directors. Um, I think it really just requires an understanding of the overall arc. Um, I never, as an actor, felt as uh, sometimes, uh, initially, I think, there, you know, you have three lines in an episode of something, you think this whole show's about me. Well, I, you know, it's, everything seems to be, you know, you only see it through that prism. I've always been able to sort of look at uh, a script, uh, um, a film that I've been in, and understand my role in that and not try to make it any more than what it was, and really kind of understanding the overall story of what this particular script is and not trying to make any more of that. So I, I think if there's, there's an understanding of material and um, a desire uh, and, and an ability to sort of talk about it and understand the, the sort of path that, that this story is going to take, um, and based on the experiences of discussions when you do have with actors when you're directing them, where they're coming from whether they can understand one aspect or they're coming purely from, a, from an acting standpoint, you pretty much can gauge as to whether this person will be able to grasp the whole other side, which is production, which is uh, you know, what happens in those seven days of prep, which is entirely different than when you step on uh, in front of the cameras and you, you have a rehearsal before you shoot the scene. But you bring up a really good point, I think, if I can, is that you know, you know, it's not the business's job to just say yes to you because yes to you, you have a passion for something. It's, I mean, I remember when I was doing this show that I wrote that I want, and I was an actor. It was a means for me to get acting work. And I got approached by an agent who wanted to represent me as a writer. And I said, well, you'll have to represent me as an actor, too. And he was like, well, we're, no. And I was like, what? And nobody would, nobody would, I could not make that happen. They, Hollywood at that time, and maybe still, wanted, you, you know, I know what to do with you as a writer. I don't know what to do with you as an actor. And it's not our job to make sure you can act. And it devastated me. I was, I found it so like offensive that they would make me pick, you know. And it's, but it's not their job to make sure I can do all the things that I want to do. It's our job to, if you have a, if you feel compelled to do something, to sort of prove to yourself and to others that there is value in that. And it's a really hard. And you know, I was always an actor first, but it was always the hardest thing for me to get leverage on. So then you, if you get leverage as a writer then, and you develop that craft, then you do that and you either give up the other or you continue to try to find ways to prove to yourself and others that you can do that. But it's interesting that you have to create... They will put you in, I mean they do, they put you in a box though. It, it's oftentimes it's, it's easier. Uh, you know, I've been directing now for more than 10 years and, and for the first couple of years it's always like, oh, 
They're, they have an actor coming into directing. And it's now changed, and now it's, you're gonna go back to acting? <laughs> uh, but it is, I mean, it, you, it takes a while, because they think that you've been given your shot, and, and quite frankly, you know, because I was one of the uh, actors on the show, I was at least looked at, and I, I did have a leg up on that. But if, 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 if I hadn't done the, the short that we had done, it, it, I wouldn't be, uh, I wouldn't have gotten that shot. Um, I, I think today, because of the web and because of really cheap camera, it's not like 20 years ago when you had to get, you know, you had to get film stock. So it's both easier to prove yourself, and I feel like it's still just as hard because people are like, oh, he's got a web series. Like, but what you guys are, I think all of you are a testament to, well, you're going to make a web series, or you're going to make a web series, or you're going to do a podcast. Like, that these are all things that end up leading back to maybe what you wanted to do to begin with, but it's, I, I can't figure out if it's easier or harder. Like I know it's more accessible, but I don't know if people, I feel like the box is still pretty opaque. But, but to, um, Hello again. <laughs> remember Scott, everybody? Hi, I have the mic again. <laughs> I don't know if you, I don't know if, how many of you have seen the show, but it's hysterically funny. I, you. Yeah, I don't think anyone knows who I am. But <laughs> you like it. He, uh, the, the show, I, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not doing it justice, but it feels to me like a deconstruction of a talk show. Or it's so hard to construct something. <laughs> it's much easier to deconstruct it. <laughs> but he's got it. He's got it. it it's, it's like a normal talk show, but the people that come on, like, hey, there's an animal trainer, but it's Paul Rudd, or hey, look, there's a. That's the only yeah, thing yeah. I can think of. And you know, Paul Rudd was not on it playing that. Yeah. Yeah. But, but he could have. He, he could have, he could have yeah. very much, yeah. So like, uh, we'll have Will Forte on as a hero pilot who crash landed a plane into a mall parking lot and then you find out it's just because he was flying too low because he was stalking his ex-girlfriend who was driving. <laughs> And he wanted to land the plane at that mall because he wanted to get something to eat. So, but who, who is the who is the superstar guest in that episode? In that particular guest, that was Zach Galifianakis. Yeah. So, so he's really interviewing Zach, sort of really interviewing Zach Galifianakis, yeah. and then they bring on like, and now we're gonna, you know, let's hear from this super pilot, and then the two of them kind of. Yeah. So it's the fun part to me is the real person inter interacting with the fake person, and, and the three of us kind of having a conversation. About something totally fake. But, not but. And? Uh, hooray. And, yeah. I'm going to get improv, but. Uh, uh, but hooray is a certain yeah. style of improv. But, but no. <laughs> but hooray! <laughs> but who gives a shit? No, uh, you've written pilots, you've written half hour yeah. pilots that aren't deconstructing anything. You've just written. No, I've written a lot of pilots. I've written hour pilots. I, 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 for, for a good 10 years after I got off Mr. Show, I just was a writer and I just. Uh, wrote pilot after pilot and, and a, a ton of movies, most of which did not get made. Run, um, Ronnie, Run. Run, Ronnie, Run did get made, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, Shark Tale did get made, um, but but most of the pilots either would get made or, and not get ordered or just not even get made. Um, and I just got very frustrated with that. I just you know because I, I started much like you, I started writing as a means to perform. Um, I, I just wrote all my own sketches and and was a was a performer. But the very first day. On Mr. Show, my very first writing job, I was told, hey, don't go writing stuff for yourself. Make sure, because we're not going to put you on the show. <laughs> so just write for Those us. Those guys are assholes. No, no, they were great. But I mean, the good part was is then I acted on that show a lot. But I just got into this groove where it was just writing for other people and writing stuff that never got made. And Hollywood is really tough to get anything you want done. So a lot like what you're saying with, you know, you did a short. Because, um, yeah, if, if you were just some actor and you came up to me and were like, hey, I want to direct, I'd be like, see you, buddy. <laughs> Who gives a shit? <laughs> you have to make your own breaks, you know? So the only reason I have my own talk show right now is because I, for fun, did a podcast that was good enough that people heard it and asked. Yes, and, it and is this a means to an do you, are you looking to, is the next- Mega startup? Yeah. <laughs> Semi mega star to me. I would uh, like two people in this room to know who I am. That is, that's all I want. Okay, thank you. <laughs> but, <laughs> you gotta understand, these guys are on major shows here. 
You're okay, but you're not Sweden. I don't think people appreciate that. If, if you saw, like, he... I don't know any Zach of those guys. is a big star. <laughs> He's working with, like, serious... You should watch the show. Please. Don't just watch Scandal over and over again. <laughs> but watch Scandal at least once. Um, but do you want to translate this into... Are you dying to be on a network doing a, a half hour that isn't a talk show, that isn't I, a sketch, that isn't improv? Like, I always wanted to have my own talk show. I was really influenced by... My two biggest influences were Letterman and Pee Wee Herman. And Pee Wee's on the show this year, by the way. Um, which is great. Huh? Doing all new Pee Wee bits that he wrote for the show, which is great. He's um, also the new president uh, elect on Scandal Pee Wee. <laughs> is he real? Um, I believe. But, uh, I, you know, the freedom I have, I was thinking about this because when, you know, all of the late night hoo ha happened where everyone shifted, and, and it, it was always my goal to get one of those jobs, to, get, to basically replace Letterman. Uh, and so I started feeling semi-bummed that it was all happening <laughs> and I, without me, essentially. Even being part of the conversation on Twitter, I was making fun of it, of like saying, well, yes, I am turning down the job. <laughs> but I have so much fun doing the fake version of the show um, where I don't have to literally talk to Serena Williams for 10 minutes about tennis. Uh, for real, you know? Uh, <laughs> it sounds horrible to me. Um, so I'm having fun doing the fake version of it because all I get to do on my show is just comedy. It's just like a fake interview, fake sketches, fake comedy. It's just comedy all the way through and I never have to have that awkward pre-interview uh, led conversation that you have on so many talk shows that I just, I, I, this is the show I want to do right now. And even though it's on an emerging comedy network like IFC that a lot of people don't know about yet, I think I would I would rather be doing this show than anything else. Thank you, sir. Yeah. I assume from that heavy clap, it was a man. Um, Dan. Yes. Uh, up. Mine or not? This one is amazing. <laughs> Of uh, writer, director, uh, we could get into this producing reality shows. I'm sure that's a whole other, I can't even imagine. Are any of these jobs, uh, were, were you looking at them from the outside? Did any of them, are any of them harder than you expected them to be? All of them are harder than I expected them to be. And the producing is, you know, I became partners with Lisa Kudrow 10 years ago. We became producing partners on for television and she was felt very pigeonholed by very fortunate, always, but very pigeonholed by the role she played on Friends and wanted to be seen seriously, not just as an actress, which she was, but also as a producer, as a creator. She wrote the comeback with Michael Patrick King, so she also was shifting her role. <laughs> and she came to me and she said, I want to start a company with someone else who I feel like is not just going to be a network executive or ex-network executive who wants to produce. I want to work with someone creative, and I had written some pilots, and I had made a film that I starred in, that I wrote, um, but did not direct. Um, there are some things I want. Lazy. Yeah, I just <laughs> drag my feet. But um, I, so, you, you know, Lisa fell in love with a, with a, an unscripted documentary series called "Who Do You Think You Are" in, in the UK, and we worked together because we both loved that show to bring it to America, and it's gonna be on, it was on NBC for three years, it's gonna be on TLC starting in July. But it's not like we set out to be reality show producers. I don't, I don't, and I'm not. So, I'm not, you know, it just, we fell in love with that particular project, and the comeback was a passion project. And web therapy grew out of my spouse, Don Roos, who's a film writer and a director, and myself and Lisa wanting to do something different. So, most things like that grow out of just a desire to shift to change the things that you've been doing and do something else. But then they take a lot of time. Like They do. It may grow out in a cute way of like, hey, Lisa loves the show, but then it's hours and hours a day. Of hours and kind of problems you couldn't have even imagined and unions that don't understand what you are and want to understand what you are and then audit you because they want to fuck you even though you're opening up opportunities for people. Not in a good way. It's and not in a good way. <laughs> No, I mean, I, we've learned a lot about owning content and creating our own content and the web. And it's a, been very educational, but there have been a lot of, you know, the stumbling blocks which you learn how to deal with. And, and um, 
But I want, I want to just make one comment about earlier. You know, actors, if, unless you're the star of a television show, actors are the lowest man on the totem pole. They have no, no one respects an actor. And, I, and, and I, for years, that's all I really wanted to do. So I, got, I wrote a pilot in 2003, and I remember this, and now I'm embarrassed about it. And I, we got to shoot it for the WB. And I remember telling the network that there's a role in the third scene that I want to play. And they looked at me like I was crazy. You wrote this pilot. You're the executive producer of this pilot that is shooting. You want to be on it? It was as though I asked to be the person who cleaned up the set afterwards. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I kind of wrote it for myself. I think it'll be kind of fun. And I'd love to maybe, in series, maybe get to be on it. They thought I was crazy. What is wrong with you? You want to act? You're crazy and disgusting. <laughs> and that's how, how I read it anyway. <laughs> And the thing is, it's now 10 years later, and I think back, and I'm like, yeah, it's a little embarrassing. It's, it's embarrassing. Like, I was, like, a, potentially in a position where I could have had the show been picked up. Could have been very powerful and had this amazing job where I get to call all the shots, and I wanted to play this little part on it. And that's, re and truthfully, I, you know, I've sort of been motivated by this desire to act, and yet I've done other things all these years, but... You know, if you've got the bug, you keep doing it until you get an opportunity. I just wanted to clarify that because it sounds like, you know, if you want to act, that's like the best job in the world. It's not looked at that way. Do you think um, that that it, that can have an effect on the future of your career? So, like, by saying, um, "There's a scene that I'd love to be in. I wrote the role for myself as the showrunner." Do you think that that can actually have an impact on how they view you and like how serious you are, or whether or not you will be? Um, uh, successful in an area like show running, like, oh, well, if he's got the acting bug, then he's clearly not an EP. You know what? I think it's going to be a challenge for, if I continue to want to create series, and I'm not sure I do, but if I, if I do continue to do that, I think it will be a challenge to put myself in it. Now, more and more people are doing it. That, you know, people do create roles for themselves. Ray Romano was involved in the creation of a series that he starred in, and I think the more you work, the more I continue to work as an actor, and the, certainly the role I play on Scandal, the more people recognize your work, the more leverage you have when you want to create something and you're able to do that. I, I think that's true, but I think but Brad's I point is a good one, which I think if you wanted to do a Ray Romano, if I think if you wanted to do something like Husbands or like, like Comedy Bang Bang, right. where you were a performer, but I think if you went to just showrun, it would be harder because they'd be like, well, he could be auditioning for guest stars next week. We don't know what the hell's in his head. That's like, true. If, if you I were was just, doing that. If you're doing it together, I think Correct. it would be fine. But I'm right. sure with Lisa, I'm sure on web she therapy, we, I act on web therapy, and Lisa does too, and we create it together, so there's no question. But you're, yes, if I was trying to, if I was literally running a show, but always leaving the writer's room to go audition for a guest spot on some other show, <laughs> I think it would be problematic. And in my head, I know years ago, that is the career I wanted. I was like, I'll do that, and I'll just leave when I can to go <laughs> guess. I just want to do it. Hey, everybody, I got five lines on Vampire Diaries. <laughs> totally. I'd be so psyched. They're like, what? Well, we can't break the third act, the fourth act, the fifth act. We've got, you know. Um, I think I, I got to open this. Do I, is anyone here in a position of responsibility? That, <laughs> um, I, I, I had like nothing more. All right, all right. Let's open some questions. They better be good. <laughs> in terms of like, uh, going from like com between comedy and drama, like Dan, you've done uh, Grey's Anatomy and also, uh, which is very different from web therapy, wanting to get into TV writing, I've been told, you know, if you want to do drama, just turn out like 60 page drama script. But like with a lot of like half hour dark comedies and dramedies and even shows like Girls and Enlightened that don't really fit into a nice genre hole, like do you, how do you mix between the two? Like do you feel like you have to mainly focus on comedy or drama, or do you feel like there is fluidity between the two? Um, it's a good question. I, I think that if you feel like you can, you know, it is true. If you're looking for a job on an hour show, you the more examples of your ability to write on an hour show, the better. Um, you can be comedic in the writing of an hour show, and many of the cable half hours tend to sort of straddle the line. So many times you can prove your writing for a light hour from a half hour spec script. But if you're a sick, if you want to work on a sitcom, you need to really prove that that form is something that you can master. Um, so I, you know, I've never been in a, I've 
never written on a writing staff of a sitcom, but if I had wanted to do that early on in my career, I wrote a bunch of specs trying to get that to happen. It's, you really do sort of have to choose a genre that you want. But to cover yourself, it does help to write something for cable sometimes, because sometimes that sample will help you in with a showrunner of a light drama or a darker comedy. But if you're dedicating your time to get on a show and yeah. you spend a year writing two spec scripts and one of them's a half hour, the hour job that you go in for probably won't care about. <coughs> Right. I mean, That's these right. guys, are, these guys are are using. I mean, not that it's the only reason, but they're going to the the web to do something that you might not otherwise get the chance to do, and then prove yourself that way, like completely on their own. So that seems almost a, that seems a better way to do it than to here's another spec. Right. And yes, ma'am. Chris, you guys are talking about how a lot of times you starting off one thing and then created something for yourself and then you weren't having the right. And after she wrote sketches for herself, and wrote stories. But now it kind of seems that everybody is starting to have that hyphenated career. Do you think that the people that are coming up now, especially the comedians, where you have the, your show and then now it's on IFC or Marin with WTF and Nerdist too, like is that kind of a requirement? Is that going to start to be a requirement for people coming up to have I, a relationship? I think that Hollywood has always been more comfortable. Uh, making a show or a movie that's based on something. So if it's a movie, uh, it should be based on a book or based on a cartoon, uh, more and more. <laughs> um, but a Twitter, yeah, boy. Um, but so, so I think uh, I think that's what you're saying a lot of now is just you know there's there's a lot of talk of like oh are podcasts the new uh, farm team for TV shows. No, Hollywood is always based stuff on whatever is popular. It's just podcasts happen to be popular right now. So, but I, I, I think that the lesson of this is you can plan your career a little bit, like to answer your question a little bit, if you can plan it um, of like, well, I need to write this many hour scripts, I need to write this many half hour scripts, and they need to be broad comedies or they need to be drawn, you know. You can, and your agent will always sort of encourage you to think along those lines. Uh, and you should to a degree, but once you start kind of doing stuff for fun in addition to work, uh, that's sometimes where the unexpected parts of your career will come up. And I would just encourage anyone to uh, not get into this mindset that I, I think I got into for a while where it was just like all about the work and all about like upward mobility and all, all about trying to, you know, if I write this thing, then this person will notice it. And just do stuff for fun. Do a sketch show for fun. Do, you know, write some dumb, weird thing that you go, well, this isn't what I'm known for, you know, but I'm gonna write a stupid play or I'm, you know, and put it up. You know, I mean, like stuff like that will, will put you in touch with, what, with the love of what you're doing to the extent that uh, those are the things you'll get recognized for, I think, a little more. This guy wrote a sketch about Lady Gaga causing brain damage. And then not look at it. I really have seen my videos. <laughs> Um, any other questions? Wait, I, yep, can I sure. jump on that really fast and say that I think that in any industry, um, the more that you know about, even if you're not doing it, the more that you know about the other jobs around you that work in, in the larger network of what you have to do, the more successful you will be. So um, I can immediately look at the camera team struggling to figure out how they're going to shoot in this tiny little bathroom and know what the problem is and say, is it easier if instead of the character doing this in the bathroom, he's doing it right outside the bathroom? And they're like, yes, yes, that's easier. Okay, great. And then the editor will say, oh, well, but can we get coverage for, and I'll say, yeah, we only need like one setup for this because I know exactly what his concern is because I've done a lot of those other roles. And so it just makes you more effective uh, at what you're doing because you understand the people who need to help you um, with your job, you, you understand what their concerns are and how to solve those problems. And when the cast of Husbands is doing something in the bathroom, God only knows what that is. <laughs> um, just really quick, when you guys were all starting out, did you, what, did you pick what you wanted to present yourself as? You would say, I'm an actor, and then someone else, you're like, I'm a writer to you. And then you're hyphenated now in public, but did you have to like pick one and go with it, and then reveal later, now I'm a director? Like, or did you just throw it all out there all the time? I said multimedia bon vivant. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not a joke. I actually um, wanted a title that 
didn't box me and people don't understand it and they're like, yeah, but what do you do? And then for a while I said mixed media artist. People are like, oh, so do you like paint or like make collages? <laughs> and that's one thing I don't do. Um, so I don't, I don't know how you would handle that, but my solution to handling that was to present myself as a jack of all trades. I did though. I, I, I started out as a musician slash comedian slash writer slash playwright. And then I wrote this film script that uh, this powerful agent liked. And so then I became the uh, one half of the writing team of that script who would write uh, broad comedy movies. And that's what I had to do then for the next 10 years. Um, and I, uh, I, those were the breaks that I got because that was the thing that he could sell. And until, I remember once I had a conversation with my agent, I was like, why aren't you getting me this, or why aren't you getting me this? And he was like, you don't do anything. <laughs> like, you need to give me something I can sell. So and then I was like, oh, OK. So then I just started doing a whole bunch of stuff for fun that I would sometimes not even tell him about. Um, like, I don't know if any of my agents even knew I was doing a podcast for two years, honestly, <laughs> until the network said, hey, do you want to do it as a TV show? I just kind of changed my way of thinking and just said, oh, I'm just going to do stuff for myself now. And if they can sell it, that's great. And, and that's when the better breaks came for me, I think. Any other questions? Yeah, uh, some of us uh, here are involved in the pitch competition on Sunday. And uh, I was wondering if uh, you guys could share uh, some of your experiences pitching ideas. Good or bad, you know. <laughs> I have to say it helped being an actor. Um, I was always an actor first, so when I started writing, pitching became easier for me than it is for the kind of writers that you were describing before. Um, uh, so, you know, it does help to be a bit of a performer. Uh, but, but again, the writer in you will organize. It's important to know and to be able to encapsulate your idea in a way that communicates to the other person what the show is. And uh, I, over the years of pitching uh, uh, over 100 times, and some I sold and wrote and some I didn't, um, it really becomes an art form in and of itself of how to concisely present your point of view, a series of characters, and what you believe the show to be in a way that communicates to the person listening. That could be 100 episodes. You really want to convey a notion in that room. Yeah, that could be 100 episodes. And so that becomes the task. And it's not about making a TV show at that point. It's not about writing it yet. It's about literally crafting the pitch. And I think it's an art form. Like it's Absolutely. And I think that if you study sales, actually, I was a telemarketer for a while. <laughs> and um, I'm always kind of like a telemarketer. Uh, but I learned skills at that job that I use with me every single day, particularly getting somebody to not hang up in 10 seconds. Um, and I can hang up on you on the pitch. Press the button and I fly out of the office. Um, it's a look in their eyes. Yeah, they, you can it. tell when the click happens in their eyes, exactly. And um, so yes, crafting it, and you, I mean, at least on the phone, we would say the exact same thing every time. And I know that um, in a pitch, I would always advise like, what is the genre up front? What is that? What is it? And like, imagine who you're speaking to. I mean, do you think it's a good idea to tailor it to, you know that your audience is an executive in that situation. So do you say what an executive wants to hear? Because I would. I would talk about, and not in great detail, but after you establish the story, you touch on the demo that it appeals to. You touch on why it's relevant and interesting right now. Um, and yeah, you figure out a way to say that in two minutes or less. I hear a lot of pitches. Um, for the for my production company, and I will say the one the biggest mistake that anyone makes is they do not tell you what you need to know right at the top, so you're lost the entire pitch, and you you're playing catch up, and you don't know if if people would just say this is a half hour single camera comedy, it stars this person, and it's this tone, and. It's four acts, you know. Then you and and it's a cross between these two shows. You could kind of relax as a person and go, oh, okay. And then and then they, but most people launch right into the story and they go, fade in on a, on a thing. And you're like, what am I listening to? And then uh, 
the camera dollies across a bed and it's strewn with clothing. You don't know what happened the night before. I'm like, is this a comedy? Is this a drama? Is this a murder mystery? I have no idea. That's the one thing I've given a couple of pitches like that where you can tell someone's lost in their eyes and you're just like, where did I lose you? What is the sentence I didn't say that is making you not understand this? The more you can make someone understand at the top what you're about to tell them, the, the better it will go. You know, by the way, I think that's very true to everything that we're talking about today. Everything, like if you want to be a director, you need you need clarity for any of these things. If you want to, if you want, if you're an actor and you go up to Tom and say I want to direct, you better be able to present that clearly, as opposed to you know I like what you do and, and I feel like I like I think clarity is true in, in, in everything that you guys are talking about. Even your agent saying I can't sell you without it, selling an idea in the room, selling yourself to get a job. You can be a lot of hyphens, but when you when you go for something, it feels to me like you really need to be specific about what you want and why you want it. So it's easy for people to say yes. On that note, we gotta go, so. <laughs> <laughs>